Our first, our first scripture is Psalm 145, verses 10 through 18. <clears throat> all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. This ends the reading of the first scripture. Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. Listen for God's word. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, there was a young maiden named Cinderella. I think you might know where I'm going with this story. 
After her mother died, her father remarried to what would become Cinderella's wicked stepmother. And she toiled as a maid to her and wicked stepsisters, Anastasia and Drizella, for years. And during the death of her father, which left her practically an orphan, struggling to survive amidst the abuse of her next of kin. Cinderella had nothing, nobody, and no hope of anything better for her life. Until the kindness of another offered Cinderella the chance of true life. There's a natural phenomenon that always tickles me whenever I hear about it or encounter it in the real world. I'm talking about baby ducklings following the mama duck. Despite the fact that it always worries me when they cross the street like this for the fear of some driver not paying attention, you have to admit it is a pretty ingenious adaptation. Emma, who is an alumni of the Wildlife Leadership Academy, a nonprofit organization that engages and empowers high school age youth to become conservation ambassadors, writes, as nature would have it, during the early days of a duckling's life, ducklings go through a process called imprinting. Young ducklings capture images of their mother and siblings, permanently solidifying these creatures as objects for the duck to follow. Now, aside from being impossible to look away adorable and creating fertile ground for the children's story, Are You My Mother? by P.D. Eastman, this follow the leader adaptation is also a survival tactic. Emma goes on to explain the more experienced and cautious mother in front can easily identify threats and react quickly before any of her ducklings reach the threat. The following ducklings can then respond accordingly to their mother. What's more, quote, although it may seem safer to huddle in a group away from predators, the line can actually work better to ensure the safety of the most number of ducks. In a huddle, a predator can attack all the ducks at once, whereas in a line, the predator must pick one target to focus on. This decision the predator must make will not only keep the entirety of the flock safer, but might also discombobulate and confuse the incoming threat." End quote. While it's hard to reconcile cuteness and danger in the same idea, I'm once again struck by the power of nature to protect and nurture the vulnerable and beautiful. It's no wonder how we get the word phenomenal. Jesus is for the people in this passage of John. He embodies the servant of many, of his identity as the son of God. When he saw the large crowd coming toward him, his immediate thought was, how can we serve them? But there's a problem. How are they going to get the resources they need to feed all these people? Jesus, as he does when putting on his teacher hat, sets up the situation as an exercise or lesson for his disciples. Philip, acknowledging that there is no way they can acquire the thousands of pounds of food they would need to feed this crowd in the mere few moments they have before the hangry, that's hungry, combined with angry, stampede overwhelms them, claims defeat. Andrew, a little more optimistic, yet still all the while grasping at straws, points out that there's a little food to be found where they are, although it's barely enough to feed three people, let alone a crowd of 5,000 without giving any verbal solution to this obvious predicament, Jesus, calm, cool, and collected, basically says, I got this. Now he did not have to, by his power, multiply the few loaves and two fish to feed this group comprising more people than fit in the Santa Barbara bowl, not to mention with leftovers filling 12 basketfuls, but he chose to. He wanted to serve them. Jesus turning scarcity into surplus is no one-off event. 
I'm reminded of his own humble beginnings as a son born of refugees, with none other than an animal stable as his birthplace, and a trough and some pieces of straw to call his bed. Recall the humbleness of Jesus' background. First, in regard to his hometown of Nazareth in Galilee, the Reverend Dr. Robert Chow Romero, in his book Brown Church, describes Galilee as a borderlands region and a symbol of rejection. And earlier in this gospel, when the disciple Nathaniel was introduced to Jesus, upon hearing where he was from, dismissed him and scoffed, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And although it is believed that Jesus learned to read and write at the synagogue of Nazareth where he was raised, it was certainly not the kind of study that met the elite standard of the day. Dr. Romero continues that in first century Israel, Jewish boys engaged in a rigorous three-tiered religious educational system. He writes, the three levels of Jewish education were called Beit Sefer, house of the book, Beit Talmud, house of learning, and Beit Midrash, house of study. Beit Sefer lasted four years, and as a part of its curriculum, students memorized the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Only those considered gifted were allowed to move on to the next level, Beit Talmud. Beit Talmud consisted of the memorization of the remaining 34 books of the Jewish Old Testament. Beit Midrash, or House of Study, was the third and final level of study. Beit Midrash was restricted to the most elite students, for it involved becoming a disciple of a well-known rabbi, and eventually becoming a rabbi oneself. Those who did not make it up the educational ranks returned home to apprenticeships as farmers, fishermen, carpenters, shepherds, etc. Jesus' disciples were fishermen, and he was a carpenter. Mark 6, 3, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? Yet he was also rabbi, the one whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote of, the son of God, the king of Israel. Romero finishes, quote, it is within this highly exclusive educational and religious context that Jesus called Andrew, James, and John to be his first disciples. He broke all the rules when he told these fishermen, these rabbinic school flunk outs, to come, follow me. Jesus repeatedly takes the lowly, the unlikely, the underestimated, the outcast, and the overlooked, and chooses them to teach and to use for his purpose. He turned these meager resources into a bountiful harvest, nourishing the masses against human possibility. Looking now at the second part of this passage, Jesus again does something wholly unordinary. I know, surprise, surprise. <laughs> The people, witnessing this miracle of exponential multiplication, wanted to exalt him. Verse 15, they wanted to make him king. Now I'm thinking, great. <laughs> this is what we all want, right? For Jesus Christ to reign, deconstructing the oppressive, tyrannical Roman rule, and proclaiming and installing instead the message of peace, love, Injustice? Well, yeah. But right now he says, no. He says, not yet. Why? While Jesus is for the people, he is not subject to the people. In John 17, Jesus, talking to God, says, Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. But when the people try to do what they're doing here by taking Jesus away and making him their king according to their ways and their ideas of what a king should be and do, Jesus refuses. What he's doing 
and saying through his actions is, wait, hold on. I'm here for you, and I'm here for all. I'm here to save all, to right what is wrong, and to give you life eternal. I'm not here to feed your egos, to justify your claims to self-righteousness, to glorify your agenda and goals, but to restore you, to restore all to the one holy God, to bring you and all to the Father, to atone for your sin and teach you the true way. John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now Jesus, in withdrawing, in rejecting their attempt to stick the crown on his head now and sit him down on the throne now and wipe their hands saying, all right, we're done, we're finished, job done, found our leader, found our guy, all good. No. Jesus is refusing to let them shove him in the box with the rest of the human rulers that lead them repeatedly to the same place of disillusion, division, infighting, chaos, and unmet needs with the desperate hope that surely this time will be different. Yeah, no. Jesus is saying, I'm different. Look and see, listen and hear that my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He's saying, God did not send me to be conformed to you, but you to me and to him. As the time is not yet, the way is not right. Jesus' call in retreating up the mountain to be with the Lord reverberates all of you, Follow me to the Father in the way of the Son, not in your way. So Jesus takes again to showing his glory. He walks on water. One way to look at the situation is that Jesus could have simply flubbed and missed the boat's departure while he was still on the mountain and used his power to his advantage by taking a shortcut there. Maybe. But oh yeah, I'm forgetting that Jesus is perfect and would never let something as human as being late get the better of him. And it also doesn't seem like the most compelling reason for Jesus to scare the socks off the disciples. No, and I think we would be remiss to isolate this event from the preceding story as if you just did it randomly. Instead, I think Jesus' miracle of standing over the sea, however you look at or interpret that happening, is a continuation or an extension of the progression we've seen thus far. If Jesus retreating to the mountain instead of obeying the inclination of the crowd to anoint him their ruler now was at least in part to point them to the Father's will and to stop them from getting ahead of themselves in making him king before the time was right and perhaps before they were even ready, Jesus just might be doing the same in this coda. He's demonstrating his power and glory that is of the Father as the means for communicating the message both of pay attention and follow me on this mission. We see that Jesus reassures the frightened disciples with the words, it is I, do not be afraid. And then when they try to bring him into the boat in a way saying, all right, Jesus, just get inside with us. Don't be out there causing trouble. Come on, just, just do it our way. Again, Jesus stands firm in God's will, and immediately they reach the land, suddenly going from who knows how long a ways off the shore to bam, they're there. 
It's like Jesus' response to the disciples wanting him to conform to their understanding of the world was, no, I'm taking you with me. The close of this threefold story is indeed not a close at all, but an invitation to proceed, for the journey is not yet complete. Jesus propels us forward into his great commission as the group reaches the next place. Looking back, first, we saw Jesus turn inadequacy into abundance. Then he reoriented the people's view of the king to take in the bigger picture of the divine plan in the providence of God and finally fix their attention on their role in the now and not yet kingdom on the call to go, to do, and to live out the reconciliation of Christ. Cinderella's fairy godmother had compassion on her and wanted to help her. Sure, she changed her outside from peasant garb into a glorious ball gown and, of course, the signature glass slippers, but not before transforming her inside from despair to hope, to the possibility of truly living in joy and in love. The care of the elder, the wiser, radically altered the trajectory of Cinderella's life. How? In love. By saying and showing that there is a better way. A way not of oppression and corrupt forces, but of redeeming salvation and the triumph of the good. And our good father says, follow me. He scoops up the young, the vulnerable, those who know they are in need, and comforts them like the mother duck to her young. He says, I will protect you. I will keep you. I know what you need, and I will provide it. You are my flock, and I am your shepherd. God brings us on and within this continuously advancing cycle we are nourished by God, taught and guided by him, and sent forth, proclaiming his message and his way, his truth and his life and his love everywhere. We are repeatedly being discipled and discipling as we follow Christ and live out his righteously paradoxical, sacrificial abundance. So accept his provision, join in on the journey, and share his truth in love. This is what we're made for. Amen.